So um, just update on uh, Rob Caleb. Unfortunately, the, the timing could not work out. And he was uh, squeezed between things. So what we're going to do is uh, go right to the next panel with uh, Elias. And I'd like you to introduce your panel when you're here. And everyone knows Elias. So I won't even bother. He's well known uh, to 100% of you. Well, I think, uh, can you hear me OK? Well, we, we were asked to, um, to do a panel on public-private partnerships. And so we thought about really inviting people from different angles. And, and uh, we will start the, uh, the panel with a slide that I prepared to sort of give you an idea of the ecosystem and the vectors of public-private partnerships that are really driving our industry. And if I could have the first slide, what you see on, on top is something I, I try to build to sort of give the, the government, actually, this was for the government, and help us understand the ecosystem. So at the top, you can really see that the U.S. ecosystem is driven by investments from the federal government, from the government. So if you look at the, I'm sorry you can't see the slide from here for the panelists, but so at the top is the federal government, uh, HHS, NIH, NSF, whatever, and that really flows uh, to academia primarily. 90% of the federal funding really goes to academia and some institute, research institute, and about 10% goes to federal laboratories. So the intramural program at NIH is a federal laboratory. Uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at uh, Caltech, that's still a public-private partnership because universities sort of tend to manage that, those labs. But then what happens, what happens in academia, it's not just the research and the discovery, it's the formation of the human capital. No single scientist that you're using in your companies comes out of the blue. It comes out of having worked in laboratories like, you know, uh, Mark uh, Tessier Lavigne here, who trained uh, Andy Plump. And they were both together, human capital that then evolved to create what we believe is the source of discovery and the source of innovation. And you have publications, you have patents, but since the Bidal Act, academia has really morphed. And somebody said, the University of Pennsylvania, Inc., uh, that time it was Jim Wilson who said that. It's true. And the universities have become economic actors through the creation of startup ventures, which has created an opportunity for venture capital to interact with academia in a way that wasn't possible before. And then you have, obviously, the industry, which we heard about M&A. We heard about collaborations. And the thing that really goes is this cycle of interactions is really critical for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the ecosystem. Last but not least is that the, the uh, markets that either relate from a pharma company that is successful, is, is, uh, is selling products, or a biotech company like Biogen, for example, successful selling products, all of them pay taxes. And these taxes go right back to the federal government. And, and sometimes I get into arguments about the fact that people claim that every, every industry product is derived from stealing uh, NIH inventions. And, and it's completely ridiculous. I mean, and I made the point uh, to the government that, in fact, the amount of taxes paid by industry is greater than the budget of the, of the NIH. Anyway, philanthropy is the last one that I wanted to talk about. And because it has a huge role. And if you really look at the numbers quickly, uh, typically at the federal government, you're talking about $50 billion going into academia. Venture capital, as you heard, it goes up and down. On average, it's about $20 billion. And then philanthropy is actually $20 billion. So philanthropy is 40% of, of what NIH funds. Uh, so it's, it's really amazing. But when you look at industry R&D, it's $120 billion. So it's the largest piece of the innovation engine. Having said, said that, I'd like to introduce the panelists. I don't, I don't think they need introduction. Mark Tessier Levine, you know, uh, it was at Genentech, and then he ran Rockefeller University, Stanford University, and now, over a couple days ago, he shifted into becoming again an entrepreneur, CEO, of a, a, what I think is a fascinating company that is going to take advantage of all the progress we've made over the past 10 years 
in artificial intelligence. George Daly is the dean of the medical school at Harvard, good friend, an innovator, uh, received uh, major grants from the NIH for stem cell research at the time. And that's how he likes me, because I gave him grants. So, <laughs> And he still remembers that, so that's good. <laughs> uh, Andy Plump needs to intro no introduction to this audience. I think he, he's actually been a leader in this audience uh, for many years, and we'll recognize that today. And uh, Nubar I've never met before. I'm sure you've never heard of him. <laughs> so, so, so why are they here? Uh, one is... <laughs> I wanted to, as you see, look the, at the map, I wanted first and foremost the, the uh, advice of Mark, who by the way, the name was forgotten in the program, so that was, apologize Mark. But Mark has the perspective of industry, academia, back to industry, we wanted that. The second, and that's, you can see where that is in the, in the, in the map here. The second is George, George has been at Harvard, he knows philanthropy, I'm sure, more, better than anybody else, and understands also academia and the relationships, so it's a lateral. And then I've asked Andy uh, from the industry to be here, because at the bottom is the, uh, the, 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 the engine, if you will, the momentum is really industry driven, and you have participated in public-private partnerships with the Foundation for NIH, I want you to talk about that. And last but not least is Nubar. I mean, Nubar has been the most innovative uh, intermediary super connector between academia, MIT, starting with, and the creation of enterprises with, uh, you know, uh, flagship pioneering and all of these concepts. I first met him at a Davos meeting, and I had no idea who he was. And then he started talking, and, and I said, "Wow, well, he's trying to, he's, he's really talking about a new model, and that was really lost. And, but over the years, we got to understand exactly what he was doing. He was identifying good science, good people, and he was seeding. So he's the gardener in this system. I, allow me to say that. And so we're going to do that. They will all say a statement about where they see their place from the worldview that they have and how we work out the public-private partnerships. And then I'll ask them about what's evolving, what's new. So if I may, Mark. Well, thank you, Elias. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. And, and maybe I'll, I'll start by focusing on the, the academic sector and just you know, some of the, the building blocks, which I think everybody is aware of, but uh, maybe with a, a try to capture where, where things are at today. Uh, academia, of course, is, uh, and research in academia is essential. It still will be the place where the newest ideas uh, will emerge. Uh, you know, Rajiv talked about those little gems uh, you know, things coming out of left field, we can look back historically, who would have thought 20 years ago that this little backwater focused on uh, repetitive sequences and bacteria, mostly academic activity, would give rise to CRISPR, both in incredible technology and a new therapeutic uh, modality. And the, there's so many uh, stories like that. So we need a healthy academic sector of scientists who just want to uh, uh, understand why is it that there are those sequences there? Why is it, you know, how is it that something happens, and from that, transformative things will come. Uh, also, academia, as this has been mentioned already, uh, provides the, the workforce, you know, the graduate students, the postdoctoral fellows who then come to uh, all of these companies. Um, two points about uh, the, 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 the health, the state of academia right now. First, um, I believe that the majority of academics actually want to be involved in seeing their work applied. When I was at Rockefeller, I did a, a poll of all the faculty, it's a small number, about 80. Um, 100% wanted to see their work applied, which I didn't necessarily expect. About 70% of them wanted to be involved in the application. 30% want to just focus, they say, we want it applied by someone else, I want to focus on my research, I'm not good at that, that's not my, my shtick. But 70% want to be involved to different extents, doing some translational work in their, their, their lab, filing patents, some of them starting companies, being involved in companies. Um, and I see the same thing at Stanford, about 70% of the faculty, I haven't done a poll, I would say, want to be involved in the application. The other thing is the students, this generation of students has changed compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago. The majority of students actually set their sights on application and industry. Um, some of you will know Nathaniel Gray, who used to be at the, the Dana-Farber, uh, now at Stanford. Nathaniel uh, tells me that you know, 10 years ago, every 
ambitious student in his lab wanted to know what it would take to get a Nobel Prize. Today, every ambitious student in his lab wants to know what it takes to make a drug. There's a real mind sh uh, a shift in the mindset of students. It's real. As a result, more of them want to go to industry straight out of graduate school. There's a postdoc crisis that you've heard about. Not the best labs, the top labs can attract postdocs, but the average lab is having difficulty getting postdocs. I'm concerned actually about the health of academia for, for that reason. So we see these trends and uh, I think, uh, frankly, the, the, the interest in application and the focus of both faculty and students in application I think is very welcome. It's different from 40 years ago or 30 years ago. There's still a lot of naivete and you know, people not really knowing um, what it takes to do that. I think institutions like Stanford, like Rockefeller have a, have a responsibility to help their faculty um, by putting in, places, uh, putting in place infrastructure to facilitate that. At, at um, Stanford, we created what we call the Innovative Medicines Accelerator to help fa faculty go through the paces of taking their work towards application and commercialization. Um, you know, you, we need to attend to um, intellectual property transfer and, and facilitating the interactions, respecting the needs of both academia and the private sector. Right? So it has to be a win-win for both. So the institutions themselves have a big role to play and uh, it's very uneven across the country. At different institutions have, uh, here in Boston, I think a, there are a lot of moves have been made, but if you go to the average university around the country, it's not as advanced. So there's still a lot of room for improvement and that's in a, a model that I would call the push model where we're trying to get things pushed out of academia. There's of course the pull model and I think you know, Newbar has been the, the master of this and we'll hear from others as well where industry reaches into academia to try to get things done and others will, will comment on that. I, I think um, as leaders uh, in the, these areas, we have to work towards you know, a very robust set of interactions between academia and industry. It's, it is the proverbial win-win. There's enormous um, uh, opportunity for synergies, but it requires a lot of work to break down the barriers, the cultural barriers, the, the legal barriers that sometimes arise with intellectual property transfer, and also, as I said, the, the, just the lack of understanding in academia what it takes to move things forward. So a lot of room for innovation, for improvement there as well. Thank you. George, from your point of view, what is going on with the growth of philanthropy in your environment and the interaction that Mark just discussed? Yeah, um, Elias, first, thanks for including me. I feel like an underrepresented minority here, being from academia. <laughs> um, the reality is that uh, you've put academia right in the center of this slide, which is sort of how we think of ourselves. Um, <laughs> of course, I, I actually want to give the lie to that. I think, uh, it, sort of echoing and reinforcing some of what Mark said, I actually think that academia is undergoing a major culture change. Um, certainly at Harvard, uh, we've been criticized as being a little slow, if you will. We've been more traditionalist in our conflict of interest policies and uh, certainly not as swashbuckling as Stanford and MIT, but I think that's changing. I think it's evolved uh, to the point where um, over 50% of our faculty on the quadrangle are now receiving uh, grant money for translational research. We have actually built incubator space on our campus and I think the, the, the days of the past when people thought of themselves as either a basic scientist or a translational scientist are, are being blurred. I mean, the reality is to do effective translation, to, to make drugs, to bring things that actually uh, are out of the laboratory and get into patients, you have to have very deep and profound understanding of molecular mechanisms. So I think it's a false dichotomy. But I was, I was having an extensive text exchange with David Altshuler this morning because yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine, the two papers describing the foundational clinical studies on which Kazjevi was approved, the demonstration of profound, I would even use the word curative, impact in patients with sickle cell disease and thalassemia, those were reported. And David and I were talking back and forth uh, about the fact that that happened because of this remarkable partnership of basic inquiry, the work that Stu Orkin and many colleagues had done over decades, really evaluating and defining the mechanisms by which globin genes 
are regulated. And that allowed for then the translation to industry and the remarkable work that Vertex has done to actually bring that to patients. So I want to say, yes, we're still in the middle of that slide, but I think the relationships with industry, the importance of multiple diversified sources of funding are increasingly appreciated by academia. We cannot get things to have an impact in patients if we're not seamlessly integrated with other elements on this slide. Can I ask you before we go, answer the question that I hear about that philanthropy has taken a bigger role than it did 20 years ago. Wealth creation in this country has created billionaires who are willing to create institutes like the Broad Institute and BioX at Stanford. How is that changing your role as a dean? Yeah, well, I'm sitting next to Mark because I'm hoping some of the dollars will fall out of his pocket <laughs> and into mine. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be passing a hat before I leave. No, I, I think we have seen, I mean, and, and we can document it. I sit on the Broad, uh, the board of the Broad, the Wies, the Reagan, and even in my own laboratory, I've seen the evolution of dependence of uh, funding. So 15 years ago, I would say 75 to 80 percent of my lab and most of these institutes were dependent on federal dollars, and we have seen a general decline in the actual buying power of the NIH, and that's unfortunate. So scientists at the cutting edge have had to seek diversified ranges of, of, of funding. So we've seen an increase in our dependence on foundations and an increase on our philanthropy. Now the challenge there is that fortunately the federal government pays full indirect costs. Most foundations are not. So we're seeing a change in our payer mix, which is making it harder for academics to cover our real costs of research. Our indirect cost recovery is averaging below what our real costs are. So we're increasingly dependent on philanthropy. Now what's interesting is just out in the Bay Area, we, uh, we visited the Chan Zuckerberg, Altos, uh, Chan Zuckerberg, Ark, and Altos, and they're sort of across a spectrum where Chan Zuckerberg certainly funded by tremendous philanthropy, but it's still fundamentally partnering with the academics, keeping the academics in their own labs. ARC is a slightly different model. Again, big philanthropy, huge impact, but these are professors that are remaining associated with their academic institutions, but put into this fabulous new infrastructure. Altos is a different model. Altos, uh, again, funded by big philanthropy, but with a frustration for the way the institutions work. So taking these folks out into an industrial context, but saying that you have all of the freedom of academia. These are experiments that are underway. I, I think of them as, as complementary to what we're trying to do in academia, but we'll see how they evolve over time. Thank you. Andy. Thank you, uh, Elise. I, I was just reflecting, Mark, on your comments around the evolution of the mindset of a student um, a postdoc or a graduate student thinking, how do I win the Nobel to how do I make a drug? Certainly, the perception of industry uh, amongst academia has changed. And I remember um, 13 or 14 years ago, I was at a, I'm on the board of a not-for-profit organization called the Sarnoff Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And I was at a, uh, the American Heart Association meeting. We were having a dinner with the incoming fellows. And one of this, you know, medical students who was all excitable and she, you know, she was talking to me, she asked, you know, we were talking and I was asking her a bunch of questions, and then she asked where, where I was I said, I said, oh, I'm from Merck. And she looked at me and she said, well, thank you very much for the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but, but, but I think that, and, and actually I was, you know, the, the labs actually, when we used to work 14 years ago with academic laboratories, it was really just a, it was unidirectional. We would fund the laboratories for their basic research and there'd be nothing back in return. Um, today, it's, it's entirely different. The, the number of touch points that we in industry have with academia is just remarkable. And it's, and of course, the, the relationship is critical. You know, you, you, we, we're talking about innovation and how we stimulate kind of that innovative relationship between academia and industry, which of course, m the majority of which comes through venture and biotech, but we can't forget about everything that we do in development, that, that it, you know, especially in oncology, but, it, but everywhere requires a relationship between, between industry and academia. Um, 
when I started at Takeda, I'm now in my, almost 10 years ago, um, when I came, we were a very inwardly facing organization. We had just, we just built a massive oversized laboratory outside of Tokyo in Shonan. I joke, there are no, there, windows are closed, but I joke that sometimes if you look at our win, the, our, my office window in Cambridge on a clear day, you can actually see the building, it's so large. S some people like say, really? They don't understand the er earth is round. But, but, but we, made, we actually made the decision at the time to go through a very substantive restructuring and a large part of that was to recognize the fact that the vast majority of medicines that we ultimately will bring to patients don't emerge within our laboratories. Two thirds of them emerge within the laboratories of academic and especially biotechnology laboratories. And so we set out to say, okay, okay, let's, let's, let's set up a goal that 25% of our innovation will come from biotech 50% will come from our laboratories and 25% will come from academia. And at the time, 0% was coming from academia. And so we put in place a number of different partnerships. Actually, we had sequential partnerships with Mark when he was at Rockefeller and then at Stanford. We had partnerships with Dana-Farber, with University of Washington, with Fred Hutch, with Sloan Kettering, with Cornell. Um, we could never get through the tech transfer offices at, and bureaucracy at Harvard, so we couldn't do that, George. Um, we, we put in Next a... Talk. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We, we, in part because of our um, commitment to Japan, we put in a very large commitment to build an institute inside our laboratories with Shinya Yamanaka called t -Syra, um MD Anderson. Um, I would say that, um, and it wasn't to bypass actually what we knew the venture and biotech community could do, it was to add on. And to, and to experiment. And now, 10 years later, I would say that there have been pockets of success and, of course, pockets of failure. Actually, Mark, one of our pockets of success came out of the Baker Lab, which is where a lot of your technology for your new company is coming from. Um, so I would say that it's been, a, it's been a, a mixed blessing, but there's a lot of opportunity for pharma to work directly with, with academia. Could you speak? to your uh, commitment and involvement in what I would call industry government partnerships yes. across with the NIH and the foundation for NIH. When we identify the need for pre-competitive collaboration, this is where the ADNI um, the collaboration was started when I was there, then Francis expanded that and you played a major role in that. Could you speak to that? And How's that working? Sure, and I'm really sorry because that's what you asked me to talk about right. in the prep meeting and I didn't right. say anything about that. I'm a s understudy. I'm a step in, actually, I'm for, not. yeah. So, <laughs> you're, you're excited. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, so at, pr pr we've been involved in many public private partnerships, and actually, the, um, you know, you know, overall, through IMI, through a a a a AMP at the NIH, actually, we've worked very closely with NCATS. Um, and I would say that my experience has been that, that there's, it's, been a learning curve. And there was a lot of early attempts in these public-private partnerships to either do too much, to be too focused on drug development, which is not the, the role of these public-private partnerships, um, and then eventually kind of finding their way to really adding very significant value. And we were talking earlier in the um, rare disease panel that one of the biggest challenges that we face, not just in rare diseases, but in many diseases, is understanding that natural history of disease and understanding the markers that can ultimately predict clinical outcome. And I would say that the greatest, and, and Priya was talking about neurofilament and a lot of the biomarkers that have emerged in the neurodegenerative field, I would say that the greatest contributions from so many of these, you talk about some of the preclinical development specialty uh, capabilities like ADME, but I think coming, identifying biomarkers that can really drive drug development and, and also allow us to enter fields that we wouldn't typically go, in, go into. That's been the greatest success. And now we go to Nubar. <coughs> many, many years in this ecosystem. Unlike Andy, I don't remember what I was going to talk about. So w is there a particular, there's so much has been covered for the last 20 minutes. No, 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 I, I I, what should I cover? <laughs> I, th I thought I briefed you before. You did, you did, but there was like five rounds of questions. We're now 20 minutes into it, one round. So I'm trying to which one should I tick, tick, no, should I just no, here's, here's speak? What, here's what I think we, we talked about, yeah. right? Let me remember. <laughs> no, 
You said something to me many yeah. times that at the beginning you were seeding, creating right. new companies. You worked with the MIT folks first, and then your, your, your models have okay. changed. So the model. I'm going to talk about the model. Work, 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 us through, okay. work us through the beginning model 25 years ago, yep. why you changed it to pioneering, where are you sure. now, now that you have Moderna? Okay, super. And, and so, I mean, I was just looking at this diagram. We don't fit anywhere is the problem. So, that's the, so the next, next year they do this, we have a little, kind of like a little square at the bottom. Uh, look, so first of all, a lot has been said. It's been an interesting thing to discuss, uh, to listen to. And I think the last panel, certainly, uh, Rajiv, uh, better than I've ever seen him speak in this way, made some important and jarring comments about just how hard this all is and just how worth it, it is, and more importantly, how emergent it is. You know, I think as humans, we tend to give ourselves the conceit of expertise, and then we start expounding how it's supposed to be done. And we forget that this is just one big exploration, one big discovery journey. Among the coolest things we could do is to discover new knowledge, then to apply it to new uh, impactful drugs, and then actually defy the incredibly small odds of getting it approved, let alone reimbursed, let alone out to thousands, if not millions of patients. And, and imagine doing that for a living, right? You could play baseball, I guess, professionally. That might be more cool. But other than that, it's just an amazing thing. But then we go around describing it as a corporate act. And I was sitting there writing down when Stelios called me out because I was writing down this part because I hadn't thought of it this way. Uh, that, you know, if you think about the discrepancy between corporate activity, and that's where investors come in and companies come in, which is in this chart, and what it is that we all do in biotechnology, which is to try to come up with new cures, new treatments, new vaccines even, the, thing, the discrepancy is that in a corporate world, you have to maximize predictable, profitable revenue growth over time. Think about it. Predictable, profitable revenue growth. How that relates to science is kind of mildly interesting, but that's you. So you got to go from imagining new pathways, new cures, AI, no AI, this, all the way to that. And so what we all do in the biotech entrepreneurial field, and then I'll answer the question you asked, what we all do in the entrepreneurial field is we actually try to overlay that with fake predictability, fake proximity of having revenue growth, and I say fake because we have no idea. We just don't. Now, if you go tell investors that, other than Rajiv, they'll throw you out of the room. And that's the problem. Rajiv is an island in a sea of conformity, absolute sea of conformity. And the conformity says everything you guys do, other than having a drug through human proof of concept, is worthless. And then you have value when you have human proof of concept. So how are you supposed to get across that, that whole search space. So why I say that is, it's going to take every actor on this chart, every version of new models, every kind of like patience we can muster up to keep doing this. In a society who basically doesn't really think that the cost of what we're charging for these drugs is worth the effect they're having, which of course if you ask the patients, they do, but if you ask the overall system, they don't. So I would say public part private public partnerships kind of how academic mindsets and research can feed into this. It's just kind of an emergent, literally, ecosystem. And let me use the word very carefully. You know, ecosystem is one of these words that 10 years ago used to be really valuable and now is massively cheapened because McDonald's calls what they do ecosystems. It's like now everything. But we're, a lot of us are biologists. An ecosystem is meant to be an interacting set of mutualistically interdependent things. Not a neighborhood, right? Not coexisting things. And the interdependence, the mutualism, the ability to actually derive value from each other, those are the partnerships that make sense. So if we interact with Harvard Medical Lab that has access to samples and wants to apply their technology to a particular need that then the government, those things are magic when they happen. And the only reason I can say this is that during the pandemic, what it took, which is really unfortunately poorly understood, what it took to develop a vaccine based on a technology that generally nobody cared or knew about, but two and a half billion dollars had been spent on developing at Moderna, 
before the COVID ever showed up, was this unbelievably interdependent, nothing like a threat to your life or your family's life to cause interdependence and to co cooperation, by the way. And so you had NIH labs, the COVE network of the old HIV trial network, FDA, military, government politicians who were making stuff up but nevertheless realized they have a job to do to get this resolved. And that was biotechnology and bioscience at its best. And of course, having lived through that, and then now coming back to the old ways, which is everybody in their corner, everybody saying, why should I cooperate with you, and what's in it for me? Um, I don't know. I guess the point is, it is so hard and so impactful that we're going to have to talk about this for many decades to come. We won't be there. But, but uh, you know, an important part, last thing I'll say is, the role of an entrepreneur in all this is entrepreneurs are about creating value. I'd say corporations are about growing that value, right? So entrepreneurs create corporations in the early stages, but then growing, and creating and growing are very different things. And the creative part is, uh, as was being mentioned earlier, uh, a hopeful activity, right? And, and by the way, before, before I know Sam's going to get up and say something about what I'm saying now, I'm, I'm very happy shit was used already so that he'll come up with another one. But he was talking about hope, but actually, I'd say there's two ways to be in this business. One is that you actually have l just little, literally hope. The other, if you have utter conviction that what you're working on is going to work and being prepared to be wrong. If you can muster the ability to be utterly convinced and then be willing to fail over and over and over again, it's okay. That's another form of looks like hope to other people because they go, how could you believe what you're saying? And the answer is, why would I work on something if I didn't believe what I was saying? Subject to testing. So there, yeah, that's what I think. I think the message here is really that the integration of all the components and all the actors and making that the, as fluid as possible, as interactive as possible is really the key. And you were saying how uh, Harvard was more inward, traditionalist, resistant, and so on. The fact is that it becomes an ivory tower, essentially. And if you have multiple ivory towers, that's the idea, really, uh, that is behind public-private partnerships and partnerships in, in general. But let me talk about something and ask you Can something I that I, uh, one second. Um, uh, we still have 14 minutes, so I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I have to fill up the space. <laughs> uh, but no, Mark said something about the change in the uh, culture of academia with uh, postdocs going directly to industry, not staying, and, um, and not wanting a Nobel Prize, although the best get a Nobel Prize and create a company. I mean, if you look at uh, CRISPR, and you look at uh, Andrew Fire, and J J Jennifer Dudna, and Greg. Uh, so I, I know a lot of people who got a Nobel and created very good companies. Phil Sharp is a good example. So it's possible to do that. But now in the future, when you look at the We've talked about the physical resources, the financial resources. Now let's talk about the human resource needed for this ecosystem to succeed. Let me just preamble this by saying that we just did a study about the human capital of the United States and biomedical research in general. And no surprise, we're heavily dependent on international graduates, not just American-born graduates. If you know the numbers, 38% are U.S. born in general, science and technology. This was a National Science Foundation. And 62% uh, are non-U.S. born. It presents a huge problem, uh, especially in the context of the comp competition with China and, um, and, and the fact that there's resistance. You heard about the uh, Biosecure Act and so on. So in this context, you're an educator. You, you now are, you were and you are again. How do we create partnerships to, to create, sustain, maintain, enhance the human resources we'll have to need as a country to make all the great dreams happen? I'll start with you, John. Yeah, um, this is a great, uh, a, a great issue. We are absolutely committed to evolving our educational platforms and programs to meet the needs of this growing biopharma ecosystem around us. We have had a very successful therapeutics graduate program 
It's 15 slots within our graduate program. It's three to one oversubscribed. It's a lottery system. We're now opening a master's in therapeutics with the goal of training this large number of students who really want to enter industry and, and move in that direction. Um, we are challenged for resources to be able to support that. We've got some fledgling efforts. Fujifilm actually funds some of our therapeutics uh, students. We have a, uh, an internship program where those who are pursuing these uh, masters and PhDs actually spend six months in industry, but we're actually looking forward to creating more academic and industrial partnerships so that we can feed the pipeline, feed the workforce. Maybe I can just touch on uh, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, international students. Um, as an international student myself, I'm Canadian, I grew up in Europe. I moved to the States for postdoctoral work after finishing my PhD in, in London. Um, so I, I came in you know, on a uh, J-1 visa, H-1 green card, the, the works before I became an American citizen. So I'm very passionate about that through my own personal experience. I worry very much about the, um, uh, our country turning its back on uh, uh, international students, the difficulty that students have who get here of being able to stay here, you know, the, the whole visa process. Um, we know that the, the lifeblood of, uh, you know, that they are part of the lifeblood of innovation in our country. Um, uh, and uh, of course, we, the geopolitical circumstances and the, the decoupling with China make things uh, also uh, very difficult. Uh, so I actually worry about that. I think uh, as a, uh, both the academic sector and also the industrial sector, we have to work together to help Washington understand the importance of maintaining a flow of you know, this, in, these in, this incredible talent from, uh, from abroad, from all sorts of different co uh, countries. We're here at the USAIC meetings. So the talent from India, of course, has been extraordinary. Uh, I think especially in the, the high-tech sector, but increasingly in the, the biomedical sector um, as well, if you just look at the, the, the ratios. Um, and it's something that we have to foster, encourage, that we have to work with Washington to make sure that we maintain that flow. And we keep the talent here. Some want to go back to their countries, that's great. Um, we want to train them to, and go back to their countries, but we don't want to push them back to their countries, which is what we're seeing increasingly. And, and, and beyond that, uh, some of the, the, um, the uh, the turning of the population against people, you know, foreigners uh, that we're seeing uh, in, in our country is also extremely worrisome. Some people just say, I don't want to be here, you know, uh, I don't feel welcome here. Uh, so I think we have a lot of work to do there. Uh, if we, uh, first of all, it's the right thing to do, and secondly, it's a vital aspect of our, um, uh, the, the healthy ecosystem. Maybe you can just have a, uh, a, a show of hands here, how many people are, you know, uh, like myself, came here, you know, uh, for after gr growing up abroad. Right. Wow. Okay. So How many didn't? Right. <laughs> right. Wait, wait. wait. Does, does Canada, does Canada really count? <laughs> that's right. And do you count New York? That's, that's right. As always, there we can debate some finer points, but uh, I think the message is clear. Elias, maybe I could just add one other thing. I think those are two great points. I'll add one other thing. This is a room full of immigrants and you know, international students, but I think it's also important to realize, at least over the years, because that's been my journey as well, that you know, if, if you think about it, we're all immigrants, given that we work on innovation. If you just stop for a second and think, what's innovation, especially like cutting-edge frontier innovation? It's just an act of intellectual immigration. You leave the comforts of what you know. You take yourself to a place that you don't really know, you're unaccustomed, you make up the language, the locals make fun of you because you're not in your element. All things immigrants go through physically when they come to this country. It's not a shock that this country that drew all these immigrants over centuries actually became the bastion of innovation. It's the same act. If you can intellectually immigrate to the possible and then get yourself acclimated so that you take, you're accepted by the, the, the priesthood that precedes you in that new area that you're getting into, you're ready to innovate, and that's what the physical experience does. So I'd say if this country does not rejuvenate and regenerate itself with a constant flow of such people who aren't American by birth but are American by choice, that is, they've bought into the ideal that you've got to just keep transforming, then you really lose the advantage. So, and I don't think that's going to happen. 
because ultimately, if our innovation slows down, our economy fall, will fall apart, people will realize what just happened. Of course, we have to fight it, but I think it starts with our universities because they are the biggest attractant to the world's talent. Now, I wouldn't say most talented, I'd just say diversely talented, and then once they come here, they figure out how to adapt to this country, and then they start making up new countries called CRISPR, called gene therapy, called whatever. It's the same act. Well, I was just one, one additional comment, which is that, that I think in, in, because there are skill sets that are not trained in academia that are necessary tr skill sets in industry, and I think we, we don't, we, we have to figure out ways to resource those. I actually serve as the chairman of the Pharma Foundation, which is a not-for-profit that spends about $5 million a year, and a lot of that $5 million in grants goes to training in areas like preclinical toxicology, um, re regulatory sciences, et cetera. But there's, there's a fundamental theme which is around mentorship. And if, you know, we're in a different place now where actually I, I think across the board in academics, if you're a student, you see industry, biotech as, a, as an opportunity. When, when I was making this transition in 2001, I was finishing in Mark's lab and I had seen myself always as an academic physician scientist and then I made the decision to go into industry. Mark was West Coast, progressive, just very supportive. The, my other mentor was, uh, I won't tell him by, mention his name by name, but he was a <laughs> East Coast, Harvard trained, Rockefeller, he's a wonderful person, but when I told him, I felt like I was one of the daughters on Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> I was disowned. And you know, that, was, that actually was a barrier. I, l luckily, Mark was very supportive and I had a path. I think that mentorship and having that, that uh, sponsorship is really critical. Yeah. No, I think also, if you recall, we, we created these sort of joint postdocs between a, an, an industry lab and an academic lab, a few when we were together at Sanofi. Yeah. And, but the role, the, the message here is that we as an industry cannot ignore education of the workforce, not just in academia, but K-12, because we have a deficit in STEM education. And this is something where uh, India, for example, has done better and is a source of, of talent. But Nina, you wanted to ask a question, and I want to give you the privilege to do that. Yeah. You want a microphone? No, no, take a microphone. <laughs> you can speak loud enough, but there are some people over there I can't hear at all. So. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so uh, I think the pharma industry and the biotech industry has done good, good job and great job really working with academia in biology department or med school. But really your future based on the previous panel, I think is with us, with the computer science department. And that has not happened in any like really effective way, I would say, despite attempts. Uh, so to go back to the ecosystem, although it is a very overused word, I mean, it's very, very far from any form of an ecosystem. So what can be done to actually make that happen? That's a great question, actually, because we see convergence between scientific fields where we don't necessarily see convergence in the, in the system itself. I mean, AI, 90% of AI work has, was done outside of academia. So yeah, I mean, we are confronting that. this right head on. Um, we're uh, building biomedical informatics graduate programs. We're building AI and medicine graduate programs. We've just founded the Kempner Institute, which is at the interface of study of natural and artificial intelligence. A big part of our support is new training. We're trying to train more bilingual folks who think about not just computer science and fundamentals of algorithmic structure and architecture, but how it can be applied. Um, we are a little concerned that uh, we are in competition with industry, uh, which can pay more and is siphoning off some of that talent. But unless and until um, these companies start actually giving PhDs, which we hope they won't because they'll put us out of business, but I think as long as we're the training ground, um, we are going to continue to promote students and try to build more of the partnerships with industry. So maybe, maybe I'll just throw in, because we're going to run out of time, one thing provoked by what George said, um, and, and you'll know this better than we do, but I think, and I've heard, and I won't say where, but reasonably reliable place, that ChatGPT4 at the level of science can basically ace AP exams at the high school level. 
The question is what can pass the medical boards. Uh, well, I'm, I'm letting in science, in science, medical is maybe a little harder or easier. I'm not sure, but anyway, yeah. science. I'm just talking science. <laughs> now I, I'm not taking a position on that. Okay, but the question is the speculation on ChatGPT5 by people who are involved in that activity, and the expectation that it'll basically be equivalent in reasoning to a PhD in a science field. To the extent that it is, that doesn't mean we won't need to train PhDs. The question is, what will a PhD be able to do when they essentially have a co-pilot who already has a PhD? So imagine PhD students having a postdoc that kind of works with them, except in computer form. That, first of all, I think the biggest impediment is going to be the professors. Because at the end of the day, for them to jump off a cliff and expose themselves to the vulnerability of not having it done the old way isn't co consistent with the history of education and academia. And yet, that's what AI is inviting the, is bringing the moment to. So I, I think that's going to be the, the ecosystem connections, even within universities between biology and computing, are challenged, I think, by the people who are sitting in these fields. And it's going to be great because I think that the technology and the society's expectation will force the ecosystem to form because you will not be able to, on your own, keep doing the same things and compete against a thousand of you in the form of this technology. That's good. I, I know you want to follow up, but maybe can I, I can add just one additional thing because I'm thinking a lot about this since I'm now, as of two days ago, at the helm of a company that's focused on applying AI to you know, the whole drug dis uh, discovery cycle. I've talked to a lot of people about this, and one of the impediments, and I think maybe this is uh, when you formulated your question resonated, is that a lot of the interactions between biologists, and you said the industry, and people in computer science, um, uh, people take a transactional view. You know, will you do this for me? You know, I'm the biologist, I know what to do. I'm the drug hunter, I know what to do. Um, can you do this for me? As opposed to uh, having, you know, creating bilingual individuals, or at least um, uh, having people work together, closely together, where the computer scientist or you know, the uh, uh, expert has to learn the language of biology and the biologist has to learn the language of computer science and they have to work together. Obviously, they'll bring their skill sets, uh, but right now there is a lot of uh, parallel play as opposed to integration of, of activities. And I think maybe that's what you were getting at a little bit. Yeah, I, uh, coming from the computer science side is actually much deeper than that. Um, so, like today, any great machine learning scientists would not go work for pharma. Despite the fact that your problems are very interesting, it's just not interesting in developing the cutting edge real AI systems. And to, to, to appreciate why this is the case, because basically when you come from the pharma, you think, that, okay, so what is the, the foundational model for me? Uh, you, you, you talk about ChatGPT 5. But ChatGPT is reasoning about text, not what it's doing. For a computer scientist, if they think about what is the foundational model for you, for medicine, for biology, it's really a different, completely different foundational model. A foundational model that would be able to reason about chemistry. It's going to be able to reason about uh, biology is going to be able to reason about physiology because all of these are languages they are not random and machine can learn them and that is a smart computer scientist you know but I, we've I learned these languages today the PhD studies through text and through language all of those concepts and so at the limit I think OpenAI and the like would argue that if you train enough and complement with these other diffusion models, you will actually be able to do both, but, but we'll see. Yeah. But it's a, I think, by the way, I hope they, I hope they go to Mark's company. That's right. Well, it's founded on machine learning and AI, so, but, but I think they're, they're, but you're, you're putting your finger on a fundamental issue that we face in our industry, which is our, in, our industry favors um, e experience. And that's why the leaders in our industry look more like this than, young, than the leaders in the tech industry. Well, and, speak for yourself. Well, no. <laughs> 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 but, but, the, but I think the problem is that the people that you're talking about, these are people that, that have always imagined themselves growing up and being in a tech industry. So somehow there needs to be, the, 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 we need to connect the, the issues that we face in a highly regulated industry that has th so much stochastic nature to it, where experience can be helpful, to that excitement that you get with something that's tech and early. 
Last word, maybe, Mark. Uh, maybe oh, I can sorry. just uh, I build on this this theme um, also because it's very resonant with me just right now. But the the you're absolutely right. I think it's uh, important to to appreciate that the models that we need in biology are causal models, right? Where you can say if I do this, what will happen to that? And and chat the architecture of ChatGPT and the training sets don't necessarily give you that. Um, but and, and that's going to be the excitement and the challenge here. Moreover, you know, there are various kinds of models. The, uh, in, in the company that I'm at the helm of now, we're looking beyond diffusion models, for example, for, uh, for chemistry. So don't imagine that the models that people are using today are the ones they're going to be using tomorrow. There's a huge amount of innovation right, happening right now. And we need people. The excitement, um, uh, I think, for computer scientists will be actually there are going to be challenges to create new kinds of models that where biology will be the, the, the test ground, where biological data sets will give rise to new architectures and new ways of interrogating things. So uh, I'll use this as a pitch for my company. Please send me your best students uh, because we have exciting problems and we will be you know, working with them to, to advance the field. I, I have to get one word, last statement. Last word to John. All right, I, 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 I've got to leave with the defense of Harvard because we've taken a few blows here, but I just want to say, <laughs> You know, any institution that's been around for 400 years can have a bad century. But, you know, we're, we're, we've come, we, we may have come late to the game, but we are absolutely ready for the game. And actually, we're open for major partnerships. And think about uh, what we're going to be building in Alston in the coming years. It's going to be a campus with the foundational technologies of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the convergence of all the sciences and engineering. So come talk to us. Thank you. I tell you, um, there is a saying, uh, not a saying, jo uh, Norm Augustine calculated, if you looked at the 100 universities that existed in 1500, and then you looked at the 100 governments that existed in 1900, right? How many of them survived until today and unchanged and existing yes, and so on? Yes, well, the answer is 75% of the universities oh, survived, including Harvard. And uh, only two governments survived unchanged, the US and the UK. And everything else went through revolutions and through changes and so on and so forth. So you are actually the evolutionarily favored, state. favored yes, I'm there. fit okay. state. <laughs> All right. So with that, I do, we don't want to delay. I, I've got to go home and deal with an encampment. So I'll, right. be, uh, I'll be back. So. <laughs>